All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. Uh, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, of course. Um, and tonight, well, it's the Dharma Doors. So we're going to look at a sutra. Uh, in many ways, this is actually going to be the third night on this sutra. Um, so the sutra is basically uh, Manjushri Bodhisattva's Pure Land Sutra, um, or the prediction about the enlightenment of Bodhisattva Manjushri. Um, we're going to dive into the sutra tonight. But as I mentioned, I kind of have a new format for the Dharma Doors, where each night I really want to focus on a theme or an idea or a concept, just something to kind of keep each night kind of grounded in an idea. Um, I'm going to use the text to uh, kind of illustrate the idea. Um, but the theme for tonight, I kind of, I was going back and forth with a few different ideas. One idea was about, oh, kind of the idea of faith in Buddhism or just the general idea of Buddhism as a religion. But I actually even am shifting it a little bit more. Um, and I kind of want to make this kind of about, oh, maybe like Buddhism and the supernatural, maybe, or something like that. Basically, just to kind of cut right to it, we're going to read, or I'm going to read the beginning of this sutra, and we're going to be introduced to a lot of non-human beings. <laughs> um, so celestial beings or other kinds of, of beings. And I do wanna kind of break down the sutra and what's going on with the sutra, but I wanna kind of use the sutra to talk about Buddhism and the supernatural in that way, but also kind of about um, again, religion or faith or devotion also, um, actually on that note of devotion. The first night of this sutra, so three weeks ago, so the first of these, I kind of was just talking about the bodhisattva path, and in particular, the, the bodhisattva vow, the vow of the bodhisattva. And I was doing that mainly because what we're reading or what we're going to read tonight is a Mahayana Buddha Sutra that's really about the Bodhisattva path. In fact, it's about Bodhisattva Manjushri coming to the completion of the path of the Bodhisattva. So I wanted to acquaint us with what makes Mahayana Mahayana, what makes the Bodhisattva path the Bodhisattva path. So that was part one. Part two was about enlightenment, <laughs> um, this very idea of like, well, what are, what are bodhisattvas all about? What's, what's this all about? Well, it's about this idea of awakening, bodhi, enlightenment, and that's what we talked about last time. So the bodhisattva path, part one, one aspect of it is sort of um, the vow. Another aspect of the Bodhisattva path is a kind of devotion, a kind of faith. And so I want to talk about the, that idea of what role does faith or devotion have in the Bodhisattva path? Or, or what, what role does faith and devotion have in Buddhism at all? Does it have any place? So that's the theme for tonight, or the variety of themes. Um, and then, again, what we're going to do is get into reading the sutra. I'm going to go back and forth between reading a few different versions of this sutra. Um, I'm going to take it pretty slowly. As you know, and this is for everybody that's been following along. <clears throat> so the sutra that I am, that I'm reading is in the Treasury of Mahayana Sutras. So it, it is in the Ratnakuta collection. Um, I'm going to have a lot to say about the version that's in here. So if you're familiar with the Ratnakuta, the big pile or heap of jewels, this collection of 49 Mahayana Buddha Sutras, this is sutra number 15. Okay. Um, and so we're going to talk about this. I'm also going to be reading from 
uh, primarily probably from the a version that's being translated from Tibetan. Um, and Tanya put the link for the website that has the English version of that. Oh, thank you, Tanya. Um, and so if you want to read along, there's that version too. But then I'm also going to be reading from my own translation from the sans or from the Chinese, from the Chinese. <laughs> so we've kind of got three versions. Um, but don't worry, I, I, I hope it won't be that convoluted in that sense. Um, and the main thing that too that I want to kind of remind everybody, the idea of this new format of Dharma Doors is to encourage questions, ideas, comments. So if at any point anybody just has ideas, please feel free. Okay, so let's have some fun. Let's get into the Manjushri uh, Sutra. Um, and so let's begin. Um, it's always appropriate to mention the title again. So in the Sanskrit, which has been to, translated into Tibetan, the title is the Manjushri Buddha Kshetra Gunavyuha. <laughs> Sutra. In the Chinese, it appears to be the Manjushri uh, Vyakaranya Sutra. So, thus have I heard. One time, the Buddha was on Mount Gridrakuta, the vulture's peak, in Rajgriha, along with a great assembly of bhikkhus, 1,000 in all. There were also 84,000 bodhisattvas, Manjushri Bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, Mahastama Prapta Bodhisattva were their chiefs. There were also 72 million heavenly beings, all completely following the way of the Bodhisattva. There were also the four great heavenly kings, Chakra Devanam Indra, Brahma, and his retinue, each with 52 million attendants. There were also 72 million great Naga Rajas. Their names were Nanda Nagaraja, Upananda Nagaraja, Runyana Nagaraja, Sagara Nagaraja, uh, Dharmahabhumi Nagaraja, Atapa Nagaraja, Auduta or Audatta Nagaraja, Mara Pratyarhika Nagaraja, Vijaya Nagaraja, and Chandro. Chandrottara Nagaraja. <laughs> Those were their chiefs. There were also immeasurable Yaksha Rajas in attendance. Their names were Kumbira Yaksha Raja, Atavaka Yaksha Raja, Sachirama Yaksha Raja, Sumana Yaksharaja, Sumati Yaksharaja, Sulakshana Yaksharaja, Akshobhya Yaksharaja, and the Yaksharaja possessing great power. Thus, these were their chiefs. Okay, I'm going to pause there. So that's who was there. <laughs> Um, so this is one of those sutras that takes place on the vulture's peak, Mount Gridra, Gridrakuta, vulture's peak. Um, and this is a, a, uh, a mountain resort of some sorts. It's a, a place where the Buddha often is that's outside of Rajgriha. So the first place that I, the first thing I want to mention of what just happened this all takes place in Rajagriha, Rajgriha. And that name, Rajgriha, the root of it is Raja, king. And it is the kind of the, the capital of the kingdom in that way. And then 
in addition to this being in kind of Raj Griha, we are introduced to a bunch of monks, a bunch of bhikkhus, 1,000, pretty standard for a sutra, but then also 84,000 bodhisattvas, three of which are given by name, Manjushri, Avilokiteshvara, and Mahastama Prapta. And then we get into the heavenly beings, of which there's these 70, 72 million <laughs> heavenly beings. And then within this kind of realm of heavenly beings, we're given two kinds of heavenly beings, Nagas and Yakshas. So let's, let's start there. So one of the things that's a little unfortunate is if you were to read this sutra from the Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, they sadly, they tell you about the thousand great monks. They tell you about the 84,000 bodhisattvas. They tell you about Manjushri, Avilokiteshvara, and Mahastama dot, dot, dot. They literally truncated the bodhisattva's name and then dot, dot, dot. And actually what they decided was, you don't wanna know about the Nagas. You don't wanna know about the Yakshas. Let's just get to the story. I could guess a number of reasons. And, and it's not that long. It's not like one of those sutras where it's a giant list of people that they've left out and saved them a bunch of time. So because this is a Manjushri Bodhisattva Sutra, we're gonna get into some pretty serious pranya wisdom. We're gonna get into some serious dharma. And there's a way in which this is a kind of a very serious sutra. And my feeling is, is that they may have dropped all the nagas and the yakshas because they may not have wanted you to, you know, question this. Like go into this thinking that this wasn't serious. <laughs> So let's just take out the Nagas and the Yakshas. So they're not going to, you won't find them in that version. Then the other thing that's a little unfortunate is that if you read it from the Tibetan, which again is a, is a very straight translation from the Sanskrit, they unfortunately, they tell you about the Nagas and the Yakshas, but they say there were also all of these Naga kings, including Nanda, Upananda, Sagara, and so on. And my point is, so they they leave out that after each of the, each of these is a king, and in particular they they, they are either a Naga Raja or a Yaksha Raja. And what I'm kind of just kind of want to get at is. In, in the one version, they just leave these out entirely. And then in the other version, they're not giving you the full experience, which is the alliteration. There is a be beautiful alliteration. Um, so if you're not familiar with like poetry, right? There's this beautiful kind of, um, uh, rhyme, not rhyme scheme, but it's a kind of a, um, um, alliteration. It's the way that the syllables and the sounds kind of blend together. And so you get this Nanda Nagaraja, Upa Nanda Nagaraja, Sagara Nagaraja. So they all start to kind of have a beautiful sound. And the reason why I'm kind of mentioning this is how do we read this sutra? And actually, Tanya, I just noticed you had your hand up. So please, what, what you got? before we dive into how to read the sutra. <laughs> well, I, it was about the bodhisattvas, so. Good, uh, good, please, because I'm going to go off on nagas, so. Okay, just, I, well, I was just curious about the third bodhisattva that was mentioned. Mahastama um, so, Prapta. What's that name mean? Like, who is that? <laughs> who is that? Because, I mean, uh, Manjushri, the other one was was what, Manjushri and then Avalokiteshvara, right? But then, yeah, which who's you the, know them. Right. So, Mahastama Prapta is, yeah, it's this um, victorious one. Um, 
that she he she's kind of often a she or at least whenever i see representations of mahastama prapta um it's usually feminine yeah and the normal um thing that you find it's very common in well like in taiwan where i've spent a lot of time this is very very common you will see an image of a Buddha, but it, a particular Buddha, which is a -A Amitabha or Amitabha, the Buddha of infinite life or infinite light. The Buddha Amitabha is invariably flanked by two bodhisattvas, Avilokiteshvara and Mahastama Prapta. What you might want to know too is that and not this isn't actually mentioned a lot. It's some a little nugget that I've discovered recently. That um, triad, Amitabha, Avilokiteshvara, and Mahastama Prapta. That triad's an interesting one because it's a kind of a, a interesting Mahayana meta, and I don't mean M-E-T-T-A, I mean like meta representation of the Buddha, the historical Buddha, and his two chief disciples, Shariputra and Mahamadguyayana. And so actually there's this weird thing that I've only kind of learned recently that Shariputra has this relationship with Avilokiteshvara, which is shouldn't surprise us if we're familiar with the Heart Sutra, because the Heart Sutra is this interesting dialogue between those two. And Mahamadgulyayana is sort of represented by this other bodhisattva, Mahastama Prapta. And you can almost always detect Mahastama Prapta because she or he, again, it's usually a she, is sometimes called the, the lotus bearer and will often have in hand a big old lotus flower. There seems to be some iconographic overlap actually with Avilokiteshvara and Mahastama Prapta where they, they are often confused so they are kind of very related in that sense. I know, Tanya, I know that she has never come up for us in, in Dharma doors, yeah, so. Um, but you, yeah, you should definitely know that in classical Mahayana Buddhism, Mahastama Prapta is a, a, a big player, yeah. Okay, good on the Bodhisattvas. And we're, of course, this is the Manjushri Sutra. So Manjushri is coming back. Avilokiteshvara doesn't come back, but you know, Maitreya shows up. So we're going to get to the Bodhisattvas. All right. So actually, now while I've sort of paused, let me, uh, if you didn't know, these Nagas and these Yakshas. So both of these are characters or figures or what have you, but they are part of classical Indian mythology, cosmology. You know, the, the actual reality of these beings, I'm gonna very much leave it up to you. I'm gonna tell you everything, not everything, but I'm gonna tell you what I know concerning these. And again, leave it up to you. Nagas are these classical part of Indian mythology that are these shape-shifting serpent creatures. They are very closely associated with the water. In fact, they are often sometimes even called water serpents. Um, they are also related to cobras as well because their general form is the shape of a cobra hood. Like uh, that's their, if they're in the form of a serpent, they're cobra-esque, but again, they're humanoid serpent shapeshifters, we are to understand. I have yet to find a really good book on these uh, characters, especially one that focuses more on in Buddhism. Um, 
you can find obviously good books that will have all of the various non-human beings, but it's hard to find like detailed information just about Nagas. So everything I'm telling you is just pieced together here and there. Um, for the most part, Nagas were considered malevolent, bad in that sense. Um, they were, are, again, this, this, the culture of Nagas is alive and well. Um, but if you were a mariner, if you were a fisherman, if you, if you lived at sea in some way or had a relationship with the sea, Nagas would maybe be part of your culture, part of your mythology. Um, and again, I want to actually stop using this word mythology because I don't want to lean too much in that direction. There's a lot of kind of, if you asked me, I think there's a lot of evidence that the Nagas are, well, that it may be a way of talking about some serious forest dwelling aesthetics. If, if I wanted to keep this strictly like rational in some sort of reductionist way, then it would seem that maybe the Nagas were these like hardcore forest dwelling naked ascetics. I say that because in India, there are groups of hardcore forest dwelling naked ascetics that are still called Naga Babas. And when I first learned about the Naga Babas, I was like, oh, huh, that's interesting. They call them Nagas, or at least Naga Babas, these kind of granddaddy Nagas. Um, now, of course, traditionally, these are not humans. They are shape-shifting serpent beings in that way. And then there's this sense that maybe the Nagas are interdimensional beings. I'm putting all of this out there not to say that they are this or are that. I'm just letting you know what people are talking about. Some people might say they're only human and they represent hardcore uh, forest dwelling ascetics. Some are more about actual sea and ocean dwelling shape-shifting serpent beings, Loch Ness monster type stuff. And then there's that. And then there's those that think it has more to do with the kind of Akashic realm, if you will, um, this sort of more uh, metaphysical realm. So those are sort of your three options. Tony, yeah. Well, and there's also Nagarjuna who went down into the lake of the Nagas to get all the sutras, right? Excellent. The, the Mahayana sutras, so. Ooh, perfect, perfect. So while traditionally Nagas are malevolent or considered malevolent, like the idea is that if you went out fishing, and you got a big one and you were reeling it in and then right at the last minute you lost it, a Naga got it. If it was a beautiful clear day and you were like, let's go fishing and you got on the boat and as soon as you get out into the middle of the lake, it starts hailing. The Nagas did it. Um, and the Nagas also, by the way, on that note, have a relationship with weather and the at least the Buddhists, probably just in India in general, they seem to have understood very well the um, um, well the like the water cycle in terms of evap water coming off the ocean, forming clouds. Clouds are associated with nagas as well, and so they're kind of very familiar with the clouds coming in, raining, water going into the ocean, ocean water evaporating, <laughs> and the constant cycle of water regeneration. So <laughs> that's part of eric what you got <laughs> yeah continuing with nagartuna oh yeah uh, why or what's the relationship between this naga world and obviously nagartuna who went or who retrieved the, the mahayana sutras from the naga world or realm mm -hmm. but why why of all places this this naga world that's a great question. So, um, okay, so let me finish um, 
those thoughts about Nagarjuna. So Tanya mentions Nagarjuna, Eric mentions Nagarjuna. So of course, Nagarjuna is this very, very famous Mahayana Buddhist philosopher, um, is credited with having founded the Madhyamaka school, basically the, one of the earliest Mahayana uh, schools of thought in that way. Um, Nagarjuna himself is a rather mysterious figure. Um, there's a lot of debate about when exactly he lived. There's things that go back to around 100 BC or so, give or take, roughly speaking. There's things that go back to about 100 BC that may bear the name Nagarjuna. As soon as you're in the common era, as soon as you're around the year 100 AD, that's probably a little bit safer, or at least a sure thing about when Nagarjuna was, or at least around 100 AD, we know Nagarjuna's writings were, were very, uh, they were around, put it that way. Nagarjuna is interesting because I won't tell you the whole fun narrative of his life, um, but the basic gist of it is that he um, was originally a, a Hinayana monastic. He was originally basically like an early school um, type of a Buddhist. He was very proficient in what is called the Abhidharma, the sort of the study of the higher Dharma in that way. Um, and the story is, is, is that he was uh, visited by Nagas in human form. And he followed them and actually discovered their underwater, magical underwater world and gained entry to the underwater world of the Nagas only to find there all of these previously undiscovered Mahayana Buddhist sutras. So that's right. A lot of sutras, not exactly the one that we're reading, but mainly the Pranya Paramita sutras, they, at least in some traditions, they are considered to come not from the Nagas. And actually, if you're not familiar with this story, I'll mention it. Um, if you ever come across this image, and this is the only one I have, but it's an image of a Buddha, seated on a seven-headed cobra. So I don't know if you'll be able to see all the seven heads of cobra, and that's the cobra's base. So this is a pretty popular image. I think I got this one in Thailand. Um, but this is the Buddha and a Naga, but not just any Naga. This particular Naga is called Muchalinda. And Muchalinda is sort of the the granddaddy of all the Nagas in that sense. And even though, you know, Muchalinda doesn't appear in our list of, of Nagas from the Sutra, but the idea is if you ever come across this representation of the Buddha, what this represents is it's a particular moment in the life story of the Buddha. He, the Buddha is under the Bodhi tree, under the tree of enlightenment. He has just achieved awakening. And as a result of this achievement of awakening, there have been these series of meteorological events. There's been hail, there's been storms, there's been an earthquake, there's a lot going on. And the story is that Mucha Linda, this really, you know, notoriously, you know, evil, bad, king of the Nagas was slithering through the forest when Muchalinda came upon huh, the fully awakened Buddha. And the story, or at least the story as, as I like to tell it, is that for the first time in Muchalinda's life, upon seeing the Buddha being pelted by hail, being rained on, Muchalinda actually for the first time felt compassion for another being. And feeling such compassion for the Buddha being pelted, being rained on, Muchalinda slithered over, 
coiled himself under the Buddha, lifting him up, and then with his seven-headed cobra hood, covered the Buddha. That's what this is a moment, the moment is. Muchalinda protecting the Buddha from the hail. And in exchange for the protection, during that time, the Buddha gave Muchalinda secret sutra teachings regarding pranya, regarding emptiness, and all of that. And then Muchalinda took all of those pranya paramita sutras and brought them down to the underwater world where they were waiting for hundreds of years for Nagarjuna to come discover the underwater world and to bring the Pranya Paramita Sutras to the realm of mankind. <laughs> now, I think it's really nice to understand that that's kind of an origin story of the Mahayana Sutras. Pranya, the Pranya Paramita Sutras, even a sutra like, what, like we're reading, I know, it doesn't sound like your Diga Nikaya. It doesn't sound like your Pali Suttas. The Pranya Paramita Sutras are crazy. The, all these other ones are like, there's a lot going on that doesn't go on in here. And one way of describing, well, where did these Pranya Paramita Sutras come from? One way of describing it is, well, <laughs> They, were, they had been stored for hundreds of years because we weren't ready yet. And then Nagarjuna went down, hung out with the Nagas and brought back the wisdom. So you could read that as many Buddhists do, which is they are the real teachings of the Buddha. They've just been hidden for a while. So that's one idea. Or you can hear that whole story about Nagarjuna as, you know, maybe Nagarjuna was a guy and he went hanging out with those Naga Babas and they introduced him to the, some wild meditation techniques and Nagarjuna figured some stuff out and attributed it to the Buddha. Maybe that was the way it went down. Who is really to say, you know, the, these things are, we don't know. I am always kind of the type of person that doesn't like to dismiss mythology. I think these stories are telling us something. So, um, so that's the connection with Nagarjuna. What I've heard is that this person that we call Nagarjuna, I've heard that his birth name was Arjuna or Arjun. And after he became associated with the Nagas, he became the Naga, Naga Arjuna or Nagarjuna. The reason why that's interesting, if Nagarjuna, the root of the word Arjun or Arjuna, the reason why that's interesting is because the, the hero of the Bhagavad Gita which is also from the exact same time period we're talking about. The Bhagavad Gita kind of arises also around 100 BC, 100 AD, sometime around that time period. And the hero of that epic Hindu poem is Arjuna or Arjuna, the archer. So, you know, it was somebody saying, oh yeah, this is the, the Naga Arjuna over here. Who knows? Again, I, I don't know, but this person, this philosopher, has a really deep connection to these Nagas, so much so that he's known as Naga Arjuna or Nagarjuna. Okay, so that's Nagarjuna. That's also the connection with the Mahayana. So one of the reasons why the Nagas would be appearing here, this is very much a Mahayana Buddhist Sutra. Um, so those are the Nagas. We were given a number of Naga Rajas, Naga Kings. And I just want you to know that these are fairly, um, especially Nanda, the Naga called Nanda, the Naga called Upananda, um, Sagara, and 
those those three in particular, you see a lot. I've seen all of these names other places, but those three nagas, they're very, very common. And in particular, Sagara, the, the Naga Sagara is, I think he has his own sutra. I'm pretty sure he has his own sutra. And then the Naga Sagara, Sagara's daughter, the Naga princess, appears in the Lotus Sutra in a very, very famous chapter of the Lotus Sutra, there appears a Naga princess who's the daughter of this Sagara. So what I wanna say regarding that is that all these, these Nagas, they have a, a tradition around them, almost to the point where you start to think maybe they were real people <laughs> in a way. Maybe, maybe not. Again, I don't want to kind of come down too hard in any one direction on that. But I just want you to know that whether they are real historical people, real historical Nagas, or otherwise, these are kind of characters within the world of Mahayana Buddhism. It's kind of like this, um, you know, it's kind of like the Marvel universe, frankly. It's kind of like this big kind of comic book universe where you have, you know, like I said, Sugara has his own sutra, like a spin-off sutra and all of that. So there's a very, very rich narrative culture to Mahayana Buddhism. And, you know, that's part of what I want to share here with Dharma doors or kind of all of that rich uh, narrative culture. Okay. Any questions about Nagas before we move to Yakshas? Cool. All right. Um, so Yakshas are, in the most general sense, they are nature spirits. Specifically, they are almost always tree spirits. I have seen Yakshas associated with other things, I think maybe rocks, ponds, or lakes or rivers, but it's almost always trees. They're tree spirits, and they are also a part of, you know, pre-Buddhist culture. So in India, before Buddhism, people were talking about yakshas and nagas. Buddhism comes along, and in, an interesting uh, connection between yakshas, these tree spirits, an interesting connection with yakshas and Buddhism is you, you may be familiar, sorry, you may be familiar with the story of It was during the period of austerities, so during the period of Siddhartha's life when he was a forest dweller, you may be familiar with that period where, um, I, and I don't have an image of this around, I wish I did, another little statue image I could show you that you're probably familiar with is uh, the so-called skeletal Buddha. If you've ever seen an image of the Buddha where he looks literally like a skeleton. So that's that image of a Buddha as the skeleton is the period of austerities. This is actually the deep, deep period of practice before the Buddha goes and achieves enlightenment. And that particular moment where the Buddha had been fasting for months had been seated in meditation for months to the point of emaciation. You might be familiar with the story about the goat herder girl that comes along and sees the Buddha and gives and offers a bowl of milk and the Buddha takes the milk and then is revived and that's what gives him the energy to then go sit under the Bodhi tree and achieve enlightenment. So it's a, kind of an important moment in the life story of the Buddha. What's in some versions of the story, the reason why the goat herder girl 
offered the bowl of milk. The story that this comes from, the Buddha had been sitting at the base of the tree for so long that it basically kind of started, like the vines and the roots started to grow all around him. And so the story is that she thought it was a yaksha, a tree spirit, like an act, like that it was such a, it was such an, an anthropomorphized tree that it must be a, a yaksha. And so she was offering it to the tree spirit that turned out to actually be the Buddha in that way. So that's kind of a connection with these tree spirits. If you read, um, let's see, where'd you go? So if you ever read, and I did one night, there's a YouTube recording of this uh, through SFDC. I read the poems from the Theragathi, from the Therigatha, sorry, the poems of the nuns. So these are, or, and actually the really good version is called The First Free Women. That's a better translation of the same book. Um, I read some poems from that. Those are very old Buddhist texts, by the way. The poems of the nuns, of the theries, not the theras, but the theries. Those are very, very old Buddhist texts. And there's a lot of yakshas in them. In particular, I've noticed there's a lot of yakshas that are like with the nuns. There's kind of the uh, yakshas kind of, again, from the goat herder girl story I just mentioned and from these other poems. Yakshas, at least within Buddhism, kind of have a, a feminine thing going on with them, or at least they're kind of associated more with the feminine. And there's even stories about yakshas kind of converting to Buddhism. And that also makes you makes one wonder, are these, you know, mythological figures? Are they, you know, you know, what are they talking about exactly? Maybe that back in 500 BC, there were some folks like kind of Ewok style folks hanging out in trees, like deeply connected with nature to the point where they were almost considered a whole other species in that way. I don't, I don't, again, I don't know. I leave it totally up to you. I just, just the messenger. But I do want to tell you, and this will be very, very interesting, I think. I want to tell you about one yaksha in particular. I was really excited to see this yaksha in our list. So one of the yaksha rajas that's mentioned is the yaksha atavaka. So I hadn't really seen atavaka many other places, but there is an atavaka sutra. In fact, I have a lot of experience or a lot of uh, history with the atavaka sutra. And it's actually called the Atavaka uh, Dharani Sutra. Um, so this is a pretty obscure sutra. Um, I've translated it. I've translated it into English, but it's not available in public in that way. Um, I actually worked on a translation of this sutra, the Atavaka Dharani Sutra. I did a translation of it for my graduate work at Princeton. It was one of, for a class I did for my uh, doctoral work. Uh, it was a translation course. I chose this one, but I wanna tell you why I translated it. I wanna tell you kind of what's up with it. Um, it'll be a very long <laughs> description of just one of these yakshas, but I think it'll, you'll find it interesting. So, um, Really quickly, there's these things called dharanis. And a dharani is um, seemingly a kind of mnemonic device, uh, a memory aid in that way. A, in particular, a dharma memory aid, a technique or a, a tool. It's in the form of like a, of an incantation or like a spell. In fact, Dharanis are sometimes called spells or even magic spells. Um, 
so there's a whole world of Buddhist dharanis, these magic spells. And not only that, there's a whole subcategory of sutras that are called dharani sutras. They're called dharani sutras because the focus of them are these magic spells. Um, and when I say magic spells, I really mean magic spells, like anything that you would think of, a curse or a hex or a love potion or a love spell or eh, all these things, uh, something to make it rain, something to make my cows milk, something to make my neighbor go away, you name it, all of these things, you will find dharanis, these magic spells. They're kind of like mantras, but a mantra is understood to be kind of a meditative uh, aid, a meditative anchor. You repeat a word or a phrase, and the repetition of the word or the phrase anchors your mind, and that's a mantra. Dharanis, though, are considered like efficacious. They have efficacy in the world. They do things. Some of them, yeah, some of them give you a good memory, but others can actually make like make your neighbor move away if you don't like them and things like that. So there's a whole world of Dharani Sutras. They are a product of the medieval period. They start to really rise up around three or 400 AD, around five, six, 700 AD. Everybody's Dharani crazy. Everybody's talking about Dharanis. If you're in India, everybody's talking about Dharanis. If you're in China, Japan, everybody's talking about Dharanis. And just to throw it in there, around this same time period over in Europe, they were also going alchemically crazy with magic spells and all of this stuff in the same medieval period. So around the year 700, 800 AD, the whole world was, it was like Hogwarts everywhere, you know, like it was really big. So just want you to know that, that Buddhism wasn't in a vacuum or in isolation. It was part of a whole cultural world movement at the time. Anyways, I decided to translate this Atavaka Dharani Sutra for one particular reason. And it's the only reason why I've gone this far to tell you about all of this. So, in the Atavaka Dharani Sutra, we are introduced to Atavaka, who is actually in that sutra called a demon general. And he has a army of demons. And you can actually employ Atavaka for your use. He sort of is at your disposal in that way provided that you have the right Dharanis and the right ritual prescriptions. Because what a Dharani Sutra, pretty much any Dharani Sutra, by the way, what a Dharani Sutra is going to give you are probably some purification rites, uh, things to do to purify your body, observances to look after. It's probably going to give you Dharanis, uh, things to chant and will probably give you prescriptions on how many times to repeat them. That's a big part of Dharani practice is chant this a thousand times. Okay. Um, you will also find in a Dharani Sutra mudra, descriptions of hand gestures that correspond with the Dharanis and are actually meant to be recited or chanted while you are performing whatever the mudra is. There are also visualizations, things that you should think about or visualize while holding a mudra while chanting the dharani. So that is basic tantra. Basic tantrism is the harnessing of body, 
voice and mind using mudras for the body, mantras or dharanis for the voice, and mandalas or visualizations for the mind. So those are our three sources of karma, body, speech, and mind. Usually the three are disjunctured. The body's over here doing one thing, mouth is over here doing another thing, mind is over here thinking about something else. To bring the three mysteries, as they are called, to bring the three sources of karma together, Dharani Sutras provide this whole uh, ritual structure of, again, how to hold your body, what to say, how many times to say it. Uh, often it'll be, um, uh, how can I say it, uh, uh, lunar or moon related. So you will do these things on certain nights of the month, certain moons, certain phases of the moon. So all of this is what you will find in a Dharani Sutra. It's a ritual manual, otherwise known as a Tantra, although Tantras are sort of, they're even more special Dharani Sutras, a Tantra. A Dharani Sutra is still a Sutra. It still is, thus have I heard, one time the Buddha was in such and such a place. And then the demon general, Atavaka, pops up and says to the Buddha, I have all of these Dharanis that I will teach you if you da-da-da-da. And it's this whole story that goes on. In the Atavaka Dharani Sutra, there's one magic spell that's very interesting. The thing about it is it says to go get a chunk of wood from a particular tree. I can't remember what kind of tree it is now. And then it says that there's this, um, well, basically a Durrani. And it says that you should carve this Durrani into the, the piece of wood. And then using, I think it's blood. I think it's blood, but I haven't, I haven't you know, referenced this in a while. So, but using some liquid, I think it is blood. It says to basically wet the bottom of the wood and then actually what you do with this there are a number of things and actually in this sutra there's a few different things to do these seals as they're called where you carve this uh, mantra or a dharani and then create a seal or what in chinese they would call a chop one of these seals you would wet it or ink it and you would actually maybe even press it on somebody's body if they were possessed by a spirit you could also stamp it onto a piece of paper burn the piece of paper put the ashes in a glass of water and then drink the water um there's other ways to use this particular type of magic spell the thing about this particular Buddhist sutra, this particular Atavaka Dharani sutra, we are fortunate to have a version of this demon general Atavaka sutra that is dated, a rare occasion. And this dated version of this is from the 500s. I think it's the early 500s too, like the 520s or so. The thing about this seal magic, at least the last I checked, at the current moment, this Buddhist sutra record, it's the earliest ever record of printing anything. Now, we are very certain that the Chinese were using woodblock printing before this. We're pretty positive that they were doing it before this. 
But this is like one of those beautiful, you know, historical documents where it's like, wow, it's got a date on it. We know exactly when they were talking about this. And it's very interesting because when you read it, like, or, you know, I translate, I read it. It's very clear that they are not, they don't know about printing. Like it's a type of magic where you can kind of magically reproduce images. And so what I'm getting at is it's like this really fascinating piece of history that reveals the genesis of printing, where it wasn't to seemingly, seemingly printing wasn't to, wasn't necessarily to just reproduce printed things. It was a type of magic. And it's all attributed to this Atavaka person because it's Atavaka that tells the Buddha, oh, here's how you do it. So if you didn't know, you know, the, the world's oldest printed book is a version of the Vajra Sutra, a Buddhist Sutra. One of, if not the oldest manuscript fragments is also a fragment of the Vajra Sutra. And now you have this Atavaka Sutra that's one of it, that it's considered the earliest reference to printing. So Buddhism, it, what I want to say is that Buddhism has had a tremendous impact on material culture in a variety of ways. There's a whole bunch of other things I could mention too. But Tanya. When you were saying about the stamp maybe being in blood, and I have no idea if this is related or not, but it Im immediately made me think of, you know, I think like on, is it Japanese calligraphy sometimes or, or where there's like a little stamp and it's usually in red, right? Yep. Yep. So. That's it. So that chop, it's called a chop or it's usually called a chop. Those seals that you're thinking of, that's exactly what the Atavaka Sutra is considered the origin of like the right. invention of those. Yeah. And it's red. Yes. And that has to do, of course, with the a cultural significance of the color red in China. It's, it's huge. Yeah. So very good luck. Super duper good luck. <laughs> okay. So that was a long digression, but I hope you found it interesting. Um, and so that deals with all of, or some of the different yakshas that were in attendance. But shall we continue? Cool. So it goes on to say, and now let me switch. I will switch to the Tibetan version now, probably. If I can find it. Right. So that was everybody that was hanging out at Mount uh, Gridrakuta with the Buddha. <clears throat> at that time, the Blessed One, had been staying in the city of Rajgriha, where he was venerated and attended by all the gods and nagas and yakshas and gandharavas and asuras and garudas and kinaras and mahuragas, humans and non-humans alike, as well as the fourfold assembly, which means the monks, the nuns, the laymen, and the laywomen who all served, honored, and worshipped the Buddha. He received a rich supply of food, drinks, savories, garments, delicacies, bedding, and medicines. One morning, the Blessed One donned his upper and lower robes, picked up his offering bowl, and together with his great sangha, sangha of monks, and surrounded and preceded by trillions of gods, the Buddha caused a shower of blue, red, and white lotuses to rain down. This occurred due to the great strength, playful ability, magical capacity, and miraculous power of the Buddha. Then, accompanied by the music of hundreds of thousands of heavenly instruments, the Buddha went to the palace of King Ajatashatru, 
in the great city of Rajgriha in order to collect alms. As he set out, trillions of light rays shone forth. At that point, the Buddha, the Blessed One, performed a miracle in that wherever he placed his foot, a lotus flower the size of a wagon wheel cart would spring up from the ground with golden petals, a silver stem, lapis lazuli anthers, and a central and a center covered in the finest gems. In the center of, of each of these lotuses appeared the forms of bodhisattvas sitting in cross-legged position. Such was the miracle that the Buddha performed. These bodhisattvas, or I should say, these bodhisattva manifestations and their lotus flowers then circled the great city of Rajgriha seven times and proclaimed the following verses. I'm going to pause before I read the poem. So I know it's already, you know, gotten on, but this is really what I kind of meant by the theme of tonight. I want to talk about that, what just happened. <laughs> so the Buddha is headed to, to King Ajatta Shatru's house. And as he's walking there, everywhere he steps, these giant lotuses appear out of the ground, the size of wagon wheels jeweled and then seated in the middle are all are these bodhisattvas then these bodhisattvas on their jeweled lotuses go flying around the city of rajgriha seven times and now they're about to start reciting verses in praise of the buddha <laughs> i want to talk a little bit about what's going on there so I think the main problem is if you are familiar with the Nikayas, if you're familiar with the Pali Canon, we don't find this in the Pali Canon. <laughs> we don't find lotus flowers the size of wagon wheels and bodhisattvas flying around on them. It's not happening. There's some supernatural things that go on in the early Canon like I was talking about, Nagas and Yakshas are very much a part of the early tradition as well. But for the most part, the Nikayas, the Sutta, the Pali Suttas, for the most part, they're pretty straightforward. They're literally the teachings of the Buddha. They're literally the Dharma. The Dharma is about suffering, cause of suffering, how to end suffering, the path leading to the cessation of suffering. It's like information. And you read a Pali Sutta to get the information. There's truths, there's principles, there's Dharma in the Pali Suttas that you read to acquire the knowledge. A sutra like this, this Mahayana Buddha Sutra, my feeling about it and the way that I teach it is that this is functioning a little differently. And most of you know, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, you know this already, that how I feel about these Mahayana Sutras, but I kind of want to make it clear because I know that this, I know that if you're not familiar with this, this can either sound, re, it can sound weird, or at the very least, it can sound pointless. Like, like come on, let's get to the Dharma. I like enough with the, the theatrics, if you will. And the thing about it is, is that when you're used to reading the Pali suttas, you're reading historical documents. They're presenting themselves as historical documents. And there's a way in which the entire culture, by which I mean the Hinayana, the, the kind of the Theravada traditions, the, the Theravada tradition in particular, the Hinayana, they, they are treating the Pali Suttas as historical documents. They're telling you this person lived 
2,500 years ago. And he said some things that have been recorded and written down for 2,500 years. That's why you should read them. When you're used to a Buddhism that way, when you're used to thinking about Buddhism historically that way, then you read this and it sounds like nonsense because you know very well that this probably didn't happen. And so knowing that, that especially if you're, you know, one, of, you know, probably like a lot of us where you're kind of a very learned Buddhist in that sense. And what I mean by that is, is that you've probably read a lot of books and read a lot of sutras and you probably know the historical, the historicity of Buddhism. And you knowing the historicity of Buddhism, this might go against that. And then you, it, it may lead you to dismiss this as, again, pointless or nonsense. But my feeling about it is, is this. If you're reading this and you're kind of like, that didn't happen. <laughs> that didn't. That that didn't happen. The Buddha didn't. Yeah. I would agree with you in that regard. If you're thinking about it historically, the way that I read and teach these sutras is the is that they are these that the Buddha that when I read it, it's happening, and the event is happening in the reading of it. So it's not a historical event about the Buddha stepping and these lotus flowers emerging. It's actually about us together reading this sutra and me telling you, and you possibly visualizing this happening. And insofar as you visualize the Buddha stepping and these lotus flower, jeweled lotuses no less, with these bodhisattvas on them, Insofar as you're visualizing that, yeah, they're talking about that. That's the event that they're talking about. Not a historical event, an event that is experienced when you think about this. <laughs> and if you get into that mode of reading this that way, not as a record of something happened, a record of something happening when you read it. I'm going at such lengths to be clear about this because this sutra gets really wild. It's so beautiful. There's a section, I don't know when we'll get there. It will probably be a few weeks, but there is a section that I, I wanna read so badly. <laughs> I want to share with everybody so much because when I first read it, it kind of blew my Dharma mind away as far as, you know, having read a lot of Mahayana sutras, having read a lot of Pure Land sutras, there's this beautiful moment that happens. But if we're thinking the wrong way, if we're too rooted in history in that sense, we're going to miss it. So we're going to have to kind of ease into this. So. That's my understanding of the miracle of these giant lotuses with the bodhisattvas on them. Everybody feeling okay about that? That read, that idea? Okay, so let's hear what the bodhisattvas have to say. Let's see, is this doable? Yeah, this is totally doable. So it's just a, um, a few stanzas. Again, I'm reading from the translation from Tibetan. And these, by the way, let's remember, these are the, the verses of those bodhisattvas that are flying around on their jeweled lotuses. So these bodhisattva manifestations and their lotuses then circled the city of Rajgriha seven times and proclaimed the following verses. The captain who benefits all beings, the venerable one who acts virtuously, the leader of the sakyas, the gentle great personage, 
the protector of the world is coming to the city. Those who play in the realm of gods, who desire liberation from aging and death, and who yearn to defeat the hordes of Mara, they should venerate the lion of the Sakyas. Out of compassion and intent to benefit others, having engaged in proper acts for millions of kalpas, though it is rare to be able to receive the sage's teachings, the sage is coming to Rajgriha today. Food and drink, clothing and mounts, as well as children and wives, the one who gave away countless charitable gifts, the omniscient one, is coming to Rajgriha today. Having given up his hands, legs, eyes, and ears, his nose, fine limbs, and head, having given up everything and thus obtained the quality of being able to give, thereby he attained supreme omniscient wisdom. Trained in gentle generosity, gentleness, and discipline, a sublime being whose discipline never declines, the embodiment of patience, possessor of the greatest of qualities, the peaceful minded one is coming to the city today, seeing the world mired in suffering, having practiced diligently for millions of culprits, infinite unmatched concentration. The one with the voice of Brahma is coming to the city today. The great sage's insight is unequaled and boundless like the limits of space. The well-gone one has perfected these and other qualities through right conduct and maturation. The wise being defeated the hordes of Mara and attained the unmoving state of nirvana. He turns the Dharma wheel properly. The Lord of the Dharma is coming to the city today. A body adorned with the 32 auspicious characteristics, inspiring the mind set on full awakening. In the hearts of those who aspire to become well gone ones themselves, therefore, let us approach and venerate. Whoever seeks to discard attachment, aggression, and ignorance, or gain victory over the other afflictions, should swiftly go before the teacher and offer infinite varieties of veneration. Whoever desires to attain the levels of Brahma, Lord of the gods, or Chakra, and to, for, and to forever delight in the enjoyment of divine happiness, they should go before the sage and venerate him. Whoever desires to be a king ruling over the four continents, one possessing the seven precious treasures and having thousands of fine children should hasten to venerate the supreme being. Whoever desires the finest of things, such as being a householder, a merchant, or a lord of a realm, with a beautiful body, a fine social network, and growing wealth. They should venerate the sage today. It is through hearing the supreme dharma of the sages that one gains liberation and all forms of freedom. The teachings of the guides are rare in these parts. So hasten, go to hear the dharma. That's our opening poem. This should in many ways start to sound familiar. And what I mean by that is, is that these Mahayana sutras have a structure. <laughs> and the basic structure is we get this introduction of who was there. And it's usually very grand, right? Hundreds of thousands of millions of heavenly beings and nagas and yakshas and gandharavas and garudas and all of that 
then the next thing that tends to happen is somebody recites a poem in praise of the Buddha. This happens in the Vimalakirti Sutra. It happened in the Bajra, the Magician Sutra. It happened in the Manifestation of Light Sutra last time. It's pretty standard. It happened in the Sri Maladevi Sutra. So these Mahayana Sutras, they start off with verses in praise of the merits of the Buddha. And so on that note, I kind of want to continue the theme of tonight by just sort of talking about this idea of reverence for the Buddha. And so I want to kind of just spend the remainder of tonight talking about and hopefully maybe hearing from you, but just this idea of faith in the Buddha, devotion to the Buddha, praising the Buddha. The first thing that I want to say is just like I mentioned with the Bodhisattvas, that my feeling is, is that they, it's not a historical event being spoken about. It's something else. My feeling is it's the same way about the Buddha here, that this isn't describing a past event where the Buddha was coming to Rajgriha. And so everybody or these Bodhisattvas, you know, chanted these things in praise. You can read this as basically, hey, everybody, the sutra is starting. The sutra is starting, everybody. Come on, I'm starting to read the sutra. And so when I read these verses, it's our way of praising the Buddha. But what I mean is, you'll, you'll notice that each, or not each of them, but many of those stanzas, they ended with this, because the Buddha's coming to town, right? Everybody get ready, the Buddha's coming to town. Well, come back next Sunday, because the Buddha's going to be here, I promise. He's coming to town. So I hope everybody kind of gets my joke. What I mean is that when the sutra says the Buddha's coming to town, they mean get ready for the sutra reading in that way. And if you read it that way, as I'm always sort of trying to encourage my students and Dharma doors here, if you read it that way, you can really kind of be taken away by the sutra. Like if you really kind of give yourself over to being a participant and not a passive observer, that's a really great way to um, work with sutras, to practice with sutras. It's a whole practice unto itself that I'm, basically here every Sunday night trying to, to encourage. Um, you know, and I don't think I've ever mentioned this before, it just came to mind. Um, you know, of all of those early schools of Buddhism that we talk about, um, the Theravada being one of them, I've mentioned the Pudgala Vadins, the, the, the group of Buddhists that actually kind of believed in a Pudgala, which is kind of a self in a way, interesting little group there. So there were all these different Buddhist groups that popped up after the Buddha died. And there were like uh, the Kashapya, um, the Kashapya Vadins, they were followers of the particular monk Kashapya. Again, the Pudgala Vadins, Thera Vadins, they followed the way of the elders, the Theras. There's another early Buddhist group that we don't know much about, but I have a feeling that like, that's my Buddhism. And they were called the uh, Sutantrikas. And the Sutantrikas said, our teacher are the sutras, not the elders, not the whoever, not those people, not Kashapya. We just read the sutras. Like that's, we'll find the Buddha in there. That's our teacher. And I feel like I'm probably that kind of a Buddhist in that way. Cause I've never had a real formal teacher in that sense, like a formal Buddhist teacher, but I kind of consider the, the sutra bound Buddha as my teacher in that way. So, um, okay. So why I say that, but then I want to get back to this idea of even if we accept that 
this is not about revering a historical person. If we understand kind of what I was just saying about this isn't a historical Buddha, it's like a, a, a present metaphysical Buddha in that sense, that kind of like that genie in the bottle that I'm often mentioning, it kind of comes out of the sutra when you start reading it. So even if we understand that I, tonight, I'm talking about that Buddha, not the historical person, definitely not the male historical person, like that idea. But if we're not talking about that, and we're into this idea of a more uh, metaphysical dharmakaya, as it would be called, dharma body, we're still we still have this idea of revering that dharmakaya, revering the Buddha I'm talking about, which is the Buddha from the text. And so on that, I just want to say a few words about faith and devotion and, and kind of its role in Buddhism. So some of you may be aware, if you're kind of a Dharma, you know, Dharma head, Dharma student, that there's a really important teaching, an early, early Buddhist teaching, like one of the earliest, um, that's about the uh, Nivaranas, the five hindrances, as they're called. Um, these hindrances that obstruct the mind, they obstruct uh, mindfulness, actually, they ob obstruct sati, um, sensual desire, the wanting, you know, wanting, craving sensual desire, seeing things, hearing things, smelling, um, ill will or bitterness, anger, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry or anxiety. So those are four. And the fifth, nivarana, which means a covering, actually. So this covering, obstruction of the mind. The fifth of them is doubt. And I want to talk about that as a hindrance. Certainly, I would suggest that the type of reverence for the Buddha that's being kind of extolled here, the type of, um, um, yeah, this, this just this reverence. It is kind of very related to doubt in that sense. But my feeling, and many of you have heard my comments on doubt and faith, but I'll say them again. I think it's important to um, like really let go of any, the, the baggage that these words have, doubt in particular, faith, doubt and faith and all of that. So forget about their kind of Judeo-Christian Islamic underpinnings. And what I mean is, is that an example that I like to use a lot to describe doubt and faith, for lack of a better term, but doubt and faith in Buddhism. An example that I often give is um, uh, cooking something. And I like to use the example of cooking something because it gets religion out of the way and God's out of the way and all of that. So imagine these sort of two scenarios. Imagine you're going to cook a dish that you learned to cook 20 years ago. And you've, you've made this dish many, many, many times. You know the ingredients, you know the order, you know the timing, all of that, because you've done it a, a lot. But imagine a kind of a, a mindset that is sort of, and, and particularly one that's very self-doubting. So this a real sense of incapability in that way. And so imagine you're, you're cooking, but, or if you don't, if you need, if you would like, you can 
imagine somebody else. Like you don't have to own this one, but just imagine somebody else and imagine that the way that they're cooking is sort of very uncertain and very doubtful where it's sort of like this constant, like, oh, wait, wait, was I supposed to use, wait, was it, the, was it a cup of flour or a quart? Wait, I gotta go get, and you go get the book, even though you've done this like a, a lot, you can get trapped or locked into a, a state of self-doubt where you just, you feel in, again, incapable. And so you go to get the, the cookbook because you have to reference the cookbook. And then you're like, oh my God, did I use sugar instead of salt? Oh no. And it's just one moment of doubt after one moment of doubt. And then, you know, the whole, and you're constantly like opening the oven because you're, you're, you, you are convinced you're going to burn it. And so you're constantly opening the oven and like just this whole scenario. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so imagine that. And then imagine I got this. I don't need the cookbook. I've made this a million times. I don't even need measuring cups. I know what a cup of flour is. Who's going to mistake sugar and salt? You, what, you don't taste this, you know? And so you can imagine a mode in which you're confident, certain, no doubt of your ability, no doubt of what you did. You, you don't need a timer. You have a nose. It's done. Open the oven, pull it out. I've made it a million times. It takes 45 minutes. So contrast those two states of being, being very doubtful, uncertain, almost kind of scared about it versus being very confident, very focused, and just certain. For me, that's what Buddhism is talking about when they talk about doubt and faith. And actually the words, the, the like shraddha, this word for faith, it has this, a sense of certainty about it. I've even seen it translated as certainty and not even faith, just avoiding the whole faith thing altogether. What I want you to know is that if you would like to preserve that word faith, then just put it in the context that I just said, which is faith that you know how to do this, faith that you don't need the cookbook, like certainty in that way. Now, I, and I know it's almost time, but I, so I just want to complicate this a little bit because we're not talking about cooking, right? We're, we're talking about our life in that way, like insofar as practice is our life. So take those two modes, the doubtful mode and the certain mode, and apply it to the Dharma. And what I'm getting at is, is that you can sort of have one foot in, one foot out. And you can kind of be like, well, this Buddha guy sounds pretty good, but you know, people like Muhammad too. So maybe Muhammad and the Muslims have it because I don't, maybe the Buddha, I don't know. Maybe nobody's right. I don't know. So you could imagine that regarding religion, <laughs> regarding this, you could be in that same mode of doubt where it's just kind of scared and uncertain and therefore never really committing to anything because it's so like, well, but but I could versus the state of certainty. And what I really want to emphasize before I go is that this mode that I'm describing, this certainty that I'm describing, it's not about Buddhism being right and being faithful that it's the best one, it's the right one, it's the most truthful one. It's not about that. <laughs> it's about being confident and not being afraid versus being doubtful and being a little afraid because of it. And so we're interested in a, in, in a practice of certainty. 
And there's almost a way in which it kind of doesn't matter what it is because it's about the state of being confident and clear. And again, I chose cooking, but choose any discipline, an art, a, a carpenter, anybody. Notice how doubt will make you cut the two by four 15 times. And notice how certainty will be one clean cut. That's sort of what we're, we're interested in, or what I'm interested in as a Buddhist teacher is that, that state of being. All right, <laughs> that's it. C'est tout.